welcome to Navarra Live, where I am joined, reunited in fact, with Ash Sarkar. Ash, it feels like it's been too long. You tried to get rid of me, but like a cold sore, I just kept on coming back. No, I've been I've been strongly lobbying on the Slack that I get Ash Sarkar on Mondays, but I keep <laughs> trying to share you out. We have some big stories tonight. The SNP leadership race whittled down to free, although I suppose we will be talking about whether anyone else will announce. Um, Tory lies on strikes. Um, a phenomenal mandate that junior doctors have now. Um, we'll also be talking about Sadiq Khan's free school meal policy and a hilarious video from Jonathan Gullis. You won't want to miss that. That will be closing the show. Nicola Sturgeon's surprise resignation announcement last week has left a vacancy at the top of the SNP, but several big contenders for the job have already ruled themselves out. These include Angus Robertson, the former leader of the SNP in Westminster, SNP Deputy Leader Keith Brown, and Deputy First Minister John Swinney. So who has thrown their hat into the ring? Well, over the weekend, Scotland's Health and Social Care Secretary Humza Youssef announced his candidacy, the youngest ever MSP when he was elected. He's also both the first non-white and first Muslim cabinet member in Scotland's government. But he's been criticised for his handling of the crisis in the Scottish NHS. This was Yusuf's pitch. I've thought hard about it, and I've decided to put myself forward as Scotland's next First Minister. I'm doing it because the top job requires somebody who has experience, and I have been trusted by Nicola Sturgeon with some of the toughest jobs in government, as Transport Minister, as Justice Secretary, and now entrusted to steer our NHS through its recovery from the global pandemic. But I'm also doing it because I believe in independence with every fibre of my being. I believe independence is needed now more than ever before, particularly after a decade of austerity. Also running is Kate Forbes. The 32-year-old finance secretary has cut her maternity leave short to take a shot at the top job, which she announced today. A member of the Evangelical Free Church of Scotland, she's previously suggested that she's against abortion. Forbes is also against gender recognition reform, though she was on maternity leave when the bill went through Parliament. Earlier today, BBC Scotland asked her whether she would have resigned over that bill if she weren't on leave, and she said this. That would have been a question of collective responsibility, and that would have been a decision that I would have had to take in discussion with colleagues. Obviously, I wasn't there, but I have concerns about self-ID, and those concerns remain. And then there is Ash Reagan, who announced her bid on Sunday. Formerly a Minister for Community Safety, she resigned in opposition to the Scottish Government's reforms to the Gender Recognition Act, a similar uh, level of disquiet to Forbes. She's called for the SNP to allow members who have left within the past year to be allowed to vote for the new leader. This is Reagan speaking in a debate on gender recognition reform last year. So this bill may not spell it out. But I believe that we should delude ourselves. It comprehensively undermines the single sex exemptions. And we're being conditioned to accept male bodied people in women's single sex spaces. Why? Who does that benefit? And I would say to my fellow parliamentarians that it boils down to this. Do you think women will be more or less safe as a result of this law. And if you have any doubt, any doubt at all, that it will make women and girls less safe, then you cannot vote for it. To go through to the leadership vote, candidates have to secure 100 nominations from party members across at least 20 of the party's local branches. If more than one passes this hurdle, there will then be an election with all members able to vote. I'm joined now by Hamish Morrison, political reporter for The National. Hamish, if the race remains between these three candidates, what will the key issues of the contest be? So I think that there's probably, on the social issues, quite a bit of difference here. We've got Kate Forbes, um, who just said, as you mentioned in the, at the BBC, uh, to, spoke to the BBC earlier today, um, telling them that she couldn't have backed the Scottish Government's gender recognition reforms in their current form, more and and Ash Reagan, as you say, resigned from government. Um, she got commendations from the likes of Joanna Cherry and J.K. Rowling for doing that. And then you've got Hamza Yousaf, who's definitely on this particular issue, and I suppose probably the other ones on this that are uh, the kind of surging continuity candidate of saying you know kind of socially progressive values and that sort of thing. 
Um, I would say that the sort of trans thing is only a part of this. Um, the Scottish government's also got work at the moment on um, establishing buffer zones around um, abortion clinics. Um, and, you, you know, at Hamza Yousaf said at his event earlier today that he would take forward that and build on it and kind of, as I say, kind of surging continuity candidate. Um, Kate Forbes, her position on abortion, um, she did speak at a pro-life event, I think it was in 2018, and she made a sort of pro-life comment about that, um, or any choice, uh, however you want to phrase it. And I think that that can tell you that she'd probably be more hesitant about doing something like that. Ash Reagan seems, as far as I can see, she's not been an, M an MSP for a terribly long time, but um, does seem to be kind of more traditionally socially liberal and in the kind of mainstream of opinion uh, on other issues, gay marriage, something again that there's questions around Kate Ford's stance on. And what about economics? I mean, we're talking a lot about these social issues because that's what's been in the news. A lot of people are associating that with Nicola Sturgeon's resignation, whether or not that is one of the reasons she, she decided to step down. I mean, is there... I mean, are any of these candidates offering a big break from Nicola Sturgeon when it sort of comes to the economic policy of the SNP? Is there a lurch to the left, a lurch to the right? What could we be looking at? I wouldn't say that there's a, um, I wouldn't say that there's a terrible amount of difference between any of them on economic policies. Um, the only one that I've actually seen speak specifically about economics at the moment is Ash Reagan. Um, she tweeted earlier today, I believe it was today, uh, that she would be um, against a cut, a seven million cut to Scotland's uh, cultural funding um, that the government's been planning. So, other than that, I think that you've got this kind of continuation of the SNP's model, which has been pretty much its kind of life raft and staying in government of higher public spending. Slight, very, very slightly higher taxes. A lot of money going to uh, social security. The benefits that have become devolved to the Scottish government. These sorts of things. However, I've not seen anyone talking about local government funding. Um, local government funding has been cut massively over. Um, I'm not sure of the timescales, but over the over the years in Scotland, and with a lot of that money staying within the central government, and I've not seen any of the candidates talk about that and actually kind of really get into these kind of economic issues, which I think you could potentially read as a sign that they would be pretty happy to stay on course for the most part of what's been what's been the kind of defining policies of the Nicola Sturgeon, either these kind of social security benefits, these kind of, you know, public spending and then health and things like that, that that they're probably pretty unlikely to move away from. And finally, let's talk about the constitutional question. I mean, is there any significant difference between these candidates when it comes to, you know, the the mechanism by which to get a second referendum? Is anyone potentially going to put forward to say, actually, let's let's park the question for a little while, go for devolution, and then go for full independence, you know, in five or ten years time? Or are they all sort of going for the Nicola Sturgeon uh, route, which is, you know, a referendum as soon as possible, essentially? So I think this is actually the biggest area of difference between them on on any sort of things but other than the GR, other than the GRR question that they've each made quite different pitches on independence. Ash Reagan's is probably the most forthright. She's spoken about it the most, certainly as far as I've seen, in saying that she wants basically a Holyrood election, a Westminster election, any of these to be used as a de facto referendum. She's really, really big for the de facto referendum and not just that as a as a process, but that the getting over fifty one percent of the vote would be begin negotiations with the UK government for separation, um, which is quite a hard line stance on independence, and definitely quite different from the kind of easy easy approach that we um, have come to expect from the SNP. I think then in the middle you've got Kate Forbes, who's pitched herself um, as a kind of strong leader, competent leader. Someone who's going to take forward that Sam and Sturgeon model of competent, you know, steady government and slowly kind of build that case. And Hamza Yousaf, interestingly today, I think made the most agnostic pitch for um, an SNP, you know, an SNP senior figure on the question of independence that 
you might expect to see. He was basically saying that he didn't take a view on the mechanisms of how independence should be achieved. He actually made a quite an interesting comment, which is like the extreme kind of gradualist position of saying, well, basically, if we prove to the Scottish people that independence would be a good thing, would be a necessary thing, then uh, how will it work itself out? That will be inevitable. And so what that means for the special conference that they've got later in the year on this question of the mechanics of it is, you know, he says that he's happy to take it from his position on it from the membership and kind of guide that through as the leader of the SNP. So he's definitely kind of pitched himself more of a blank canvas on the independence question than any of the other candidates really. A whopping 98% of junior doctors have voted for strike action, joining nurses, ambulance workers, train drivers, civil servants and teachers. It's a big movement with some big mandates. But according to Penny Mordant, all of these workers are committing some kind of act of self-harm. Mr McLynch says that they're going to stop the trains again, the RCN, first time in its history. It's going out on a 48-hour strike without cover. Junior doctors yesterday say they're likely to come out. Um, is it the minister's, is it minister, minister's position still that it's not much you can do to stop this chaos? Look, I think it is political cynicism of the worst kind to encourage strikes. The only people that benefit from strikes are the Labour Party. Striking workers don't benefit from strikes. And uh, I think it's lunacy to say to people the best way to help make ends meet is to drive those ends further apart. These, these are not helpful. Uh, we need to focus on issues that, that each sector is facing. Those are what the respective secretaries of state are, are doing. But, but strikes are not helpful. And I would encourage people not to, not to do that. Strikes are not helpful. And I would encourage people not to do that, she says, without any notion of sort of self-interest. Of course, you don't want the strikes to happen any more than like that. That's obvious. But, but your interests are not the same as the people going on strike at this sort of very patronising tone, like she was sort of talking to toddlers in nursery school. That's not the right thing to do. I thought ridiculous from start to finish. Let's focus on one particular claim made, though, um, which was that strikes don't help striking workers. Now, on that point, I'm not convinced. To take just a few examples, in December, refuse workers in Wirral won a 15% pay increase after taking strike action. In early January, bus drivers in Sunderland won an 11% pay rise after going on strike. And just last week, striking London bus drivers working for Abellio won an 18% pay rise. So there's some recent examples of strike action working. We can also look at more macro data to make the point. This is the number of days lost to strike action by year since 1970. As you can see, there was lots of strike action in the 1970s. It declined in the 1980s and has been very low ever since then. Now let's look at inequality over the same period. As you can see here, when strike action was high in the 1970s, I showed you on that previous graph, the top 1% of earners took home 3% of national income. You might still say too much, but that started to rocket in the 1980s. And by 2017, it ends up at around 8%. Now, of course, it's no coincidence that when strikes fall, when the number of strikes fall, the wealth of the 1% increases. That's because strikes are how workers demand a bigger slice of their economic pie. In short, no strikes, and the 1% can get away with hoarding ever more wealth, ever more income. Of course, there were many other changes that took place between the 1970s and today, which could also explain an increase in inequality. Correlation is not causation, of course. But comparisons across countries suggest that the strength of unions does play a real and significant role here. A recent study by the Union Europa concluded this. Policies that restrain people's capacity to bargain collectively have proliferated in countries where inequality rates have grown most. This is the case in Bulgaria, Cyprus, Czechia, Germany after 1990, Greece after 2008, Hungary, Ireland, Malta, Poland and the UK. Meanwhile, countries that have maintained collective bargaining coverage at a high level have kept inequality at bay too. Examples are Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Netherlands and Sweden. 
Now, some of the examples listed there, they show in more details. They include the UK and Germany, where collective bargaining declined and inequality rose. As you can see here, in the 1960s and 1970s, around 80% of British workers were covered by collective bargaining agreements. It fell dramatically in the 1980s and right down to below 30%. In that same time, the share of the top 10% of income earners rose from 25% to 36%. So the, the share of income going to that top 10% dramatically rose. A similar pattern is visible in the German statistics, though there the fall in collective bargaining and rise in inequality happened later than in the UK. Now let's look at the countries that didn't restrict collective bargaining. This is for Belgium. In 1980, more than 90% of workers were covered by a collective bargaining agreement. That didn't change over the next 40 years. And lo and behold, the share of income going to the rich didn't increase either. And the same pattern is visible in Austria. Collective bargaining rates stayed close to 100% and income inequality remained flat. I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anybody that a representative for the party of capital, corporate interests and bosses is turning around and saying, workers, you will better your lot if only you meekly go along with what your elite classes tell you is good for you. All right. That's her job as a conservative politician. So in a way, it doesn't really matter if she believes it or not. It's her job to advocate for the interests of capital. That's why she's a minister for this government. But while you've presented, I think, some really compelling economic data, macroeconomic data, about showing the relationship between uh, strong trade unions, collective bargaining, strike action, and rates of inequality in a society, and I think it's really meaningful to compare the UK to countries like the Netherlands, like Austria, um, because it's not as if we've got a less financialized economy than Belgium for instance. Um, they've also had their waves of neoliberalism. They've been part of the same global economy as us. But the big difference is the extent to which they've been impacted by anti-trade union legislation. So I think you've spelled it out perfectly, that an equal society, a more equal society, which isn't just about the distribution of finances. It's also about the distribution of power. How meaningful is your democracy? What capacity do the rich have to hoard power in their hands, to warp the political process, democratic processes, judicial processes as well? These are all things which are tied to the distribution of wealth within a society. I think there's also, when you look back throughout history, a really strong case to be made for arguing that the strike, as in the collective withdrawal of labor, is one of the most powerful tools we have for shaping a more civilized society. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I've been doing a bit of research for a, a video that I would like to do for a quality media organization called Navarro Media um, about the history of the strike action. And one of the things that I didn't realize was just how central strike action was to the abolition of slavery. So in 1831, I believe it was, there was a huge wave of strike action organized by enslaved people in Jamaica. So I think it was 60,000 slaves went on a general strike. This set off a chain of events which became known as the Baptist War. And about a year later, the British Parliament was forced effectively by abolitionists in Britain and also the disruption caused by this general strike and subsequent slave revolts in the colonies to start introducing abolitionist bits of legislation. There's another way of looking at the American Civil War, which is argued by W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction, that the American Civil War wasn't a war really between two nation states, it was a general strike because you had en masse enslaved people leaving the plantations, not because they wanted an easier life as such, but to join the Union Army, right? It was a form of general strike, a withdrawal of their labor, which financially incapacitated uh, the slave-owning South, and also, of course, strengthened the army of the Union cause. Now, they weren't taking on that perilous journey because they were sick and tired of work. Um, you know, the conditions that they had to live under as part of the Union Army as black people were, were you know, really bad. They had to face, uh, you know, daily humiliations. Uh, they had to put their lives in danger. But again, this tells us the story of the strike being a tool which civilizes society. And 
one of the most common threads of that is that the withdrawal of labour leads to various forms of equality. We've outlined the way in which it leads to economic equality with that macroeconomic data that you presented, but it's also about equality of citizens. It's also about equality under the law. Strikes have led to all those things, which I think we would all agree uh, are the conditions for a, you know, basically functional and democratic society. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why the conservatives are so scared of it, why they're trying to turn around and say, um, you know, this won't benefit you in any way, because it is the most fundamental means through which we realize our collective power. That's why they're clamping down on it. I can imagine sort of if Penny Mordaunt was alive in the 18th century or the 19th century saying very similar things, you know, it's not in the interests of the slaves in the American South to go on strike. You know, the only people they're harming is themselves. Like it's, you know, you might you might say it's a sort of crass analogy and, you know, she's not endorsing slavery and what she's saying on Sky, but what she is saying is so crass that you can kind of imagine it being translated into some of those situations and it not being much more ridiculous than it sounds right now. Am I being fair, Ash? Yeah, I think you're being entirely fair. I mean, this is the thing, is that every um, conservative or, you know, kind of socially liberal, but really in practice, you know, conservative, uh, they have this thing in common, which they imagine themselves uh, that they would be on the right side of history when it came to slavery or women's suffrage or the Chartist movement. But when you look at the way in which they sneer and pour scorn on people who are agitating for further social progress today, you think, well, the same social pressures for you to conform and you know cleave on to a deeply unequal status quo would still exist in 1830. Um, why do you think that your personal metal and integrity would be any different? You haven't shown any signs of having it now, so why would that be the case in the past? London Mayor Sadiq Khan has launched a plan to extend free school meals to every primary school child in the city. The scheme will start in September and it's set to run for a year with meals being given out in term time only. It's an emergency measure intended to help ease the impact of the cost of living crisis on young children. The cost of the plan is £130 million. That'll come from an unexpected surplus in business rates and council tax income. And it will save families around £440 per child over the course of the year. 270,000 pupils are expected to benefit from the move. After the announcement, Khan appeared on BBC Breakfast, where he explained why he's decided to introduce the scheme. There are children who are receiving meals because their teachers are bringing in food to school. But also we know there are children, and it's heartbreaking, because they've not brought in a packed lunch, they're not receiving free school meals, they're pretending to eat so as not to be embarrassed. I know when I was a child, and, I, and I'm now 52 years old, but I still remember the embarrassment, uh, the shame, at me receiving a free school meal token and the majority of my peers uh, not. That, that's stayed with me for 40, 50 uh, years. And so by having it universal for all our children to receive free school meals, it gets rid of the stigma, gets rid of the shame, but also it means all our children will be eating together, great social skills, but also it means better educational attainment. You know, Price Waters Coopers have done some research. They've shown by a combination of educational attainment doing better, better mental health and physical health, at least to better productivity. So there's a net benefit to our country by all our kids getting free school meals. At the moment, to qualify for a free school meal in England, a child has to come from a household earning less than £7,400 per year. According to the Food Foundation, that threshold means that there are 800,000 children living in poverty in England who don't qualify. And that's because that threshold hasn't been raised since 2018. Now, that's, of course, a pretty strong moral argument for extending the scheme. But Khan also mentioned economic reasons for the policy. He cited research published in October last year by Price Waterhouse Cooper. They looked at the costs and benefits of universalising free school meals to both primary and secondary school pupils over 20 years. And according to their projections, it would cost £24 billion to extend the scheme to all primary and secondary school students. But they argue this would be outweighed by the long-term benefits, which they suggest would amount to £41 billion. They say that's due to food cost saving to families, reduced NHS costs and increased lifetime earnings produced by higher educational attainment. Now, if they've got their sums right, universal free school meals would seem like a no-brainer. 
But not everyone is convinced. Tory MP and former Treasury Secretary Simon Clark posted this on social media. Using millions that could be spent on targeted support to vulnerable children to subsidise free school meals for middle class parents who can afford them perfectly well is the opposite of progressive politics. Classic Labour. Ash, I want your take on this. Sadiq Khan seems like a good policy from my perspective, but according to Simon Clark, he is just using taxpayers' money to subsidize middle class children who should pay for their lunch themselves. How do you respond? I mean, that's that's always the Tory excuse whenever you have any kind of universal service provision. So when you have had, you know, free travel cards for under 11s, or if you've introduced something like I don't know, the NHS, they'll go, oh, but couldn't this be done in a more cost efficient way? You know, couldn't you target the support to people who really need it? And then you look at what they're doing in terms of supporting the most deprived and at risk uh, households, children, individuals in our society, and they're not doing the targeted support either. So let's just, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. Look at what they're really doing. They're not, uh, you know, tailoring and targeting their support. It's those people who have experienced the most criminal forms of government neglect over the last decade and a half. Now, there are, I think, some, you know, really basic reasons to support universal provision. One is that quite often it works out being more cost effective because means testing something requires bureaucracy. It requires people who are sifting through applicants to work out whether or not they meet the thresholds or not. You're also not always going to get that right. So inevitably, there are going to be, in this case, children who fall through the cracks and are going without a lunchtime meal when they're at school. Then I think there's also a third thing about what universal service provision does for us as a society, which is I think we can all recognize that if you segregate things on the basis of class, if you say, okay, well, this is what you get if you've got money and this is what you get if you don't, that ultimately makes us more socially divided. It's something which you know helps stream us into this deeply unequal social settlement that all of us, even if you know, you're not necessarily as much of a lefty as me or you, you go, I don't want to live in a society that's like that. So I think one of the things that universal service provision can do is in this kind of prefigurative way is bring us together in a way which emulates the sort of society that we would like to be rather than the quite shitty one that we have. I mean, there is also one last point that I want to make, and it's about what has changed in the last 12 years of austerity. Now, even if we hadn't been living with austerity, I would think that free school meals are a great policy for the reasons which I've outlined. I think that you cut out a lot of the waste that you get with means testing, by which I mean bureaucratic waste, uh, and also the inefficiency of kids falling through the cracks. I also believe in it as a uh, social value. Um, but one of the things that austerity has done is that it has led to an absolute ballooning of child poverty. So child poverty rates are around uh, 35% for London, 38% for the Northeast. And even those figures are quite um, misleading because obviously some areas are much richer and some areas are much poorer than others. So if you were taking an area like Kensington or Mayfair, you'd have very, very low rates of child poverty. But the area where I live, for instance, you've got child poverty rates of upwards of 45% in some little pockets around half, if not more than that. So these are really high rates of child poverty. And one of the features of austerity is that because you've had flatlining wages, more precarious forms of work, as well as very punitive benefits system, you've had the growth of in-work poverty. So really for the first time uh, in this country's uh, post-war history, the majority of households which are classed as living in poverty have at least one adult that is in work. So you have a real problem here, which is the system uh, which is supposed to distribute enough money to you know, raise children that aren't starving has totally broken down. And there is a real urgent need for state intervention. So I think that this is a 
a wise policy from Sadiq Khan. I would, of course, like to see it rolled out to secondary school and sixth form pupils as well. Um, but it's also smart politics. It's smart politics to go, you know what, we're not going to do this whole thing of, you know, wait for the general election, wait for the general election, wait for the general election. It's not just about jam tomorrow. You get some jam today. And in terms of Labour's chances, that's not a bad thing. I'm just thinking more about this Simon Clark tweet, like, because, you know, whatever you offer, whatever anyone suggests a universal policy, the Tories said, this is a waste of money. You're going to be subsidizing middle class kids um, who don't need it. I mean, you get Tories talking about it in the NHS as well. Why are we, why are we g g giving people free operations when they could pay for it themselves, et cetera, et cetera? So you say, okay, fine, let's uh, let's target it. Do you want do you want to target it? And they say, oh no, we couldn't possibly target it because then we're disincentivizing people from becoming rich. If we only give this to poor people, then we're we're rewarding people for being poor, and that will disincentivize hard work. Okay, so what is your solution? Oh, we'll just cut it all and we'll cut taxes. Sorry. We, we don't like universal benefits. We don't like targeted benefits. Let's just have no benefits at all. But that's where the Tory argument always ends up. And I mean, that's the story of the last 13 years. I suppose they might say, OK, well, we'll target it, but then we'll also add this sort of ritual punishment that makes it humiliating. That's what they do with job seekers allowance. So they say, oh, yes, yeah, so it's obviously not going to be, we're not going to do a universal basic income. We only give it to people who are currently unemployed. But so we don't incentivize um, lethargy. What we will do is make people do these humiliating hoop jumping exercises where they have to apply for a million jobs a week, even if they've got no chance of getting any of them or they wouldn't be suited to them. The Tory way. Sadiq Khan, of course, isn't the first person to implement universal free school meals for young children in London. Newham, Islington, Southwark and Tower Hamlets already fund free school meals for all primary school children. They're also already available to all primary school children in Wales and in Scotland. All children can get them for the first five years of primary school. If you spot a running theme there, it's all places where the Tories aren't in control because the Tories don't care about kids getting a decent lunch. It's, in, it's, it's incredible that the, the threshold is £7,400 a year before you're entitled to free school meals. doesn't matter how many. So if you've got four kids and you're earning £7,400 a year, that doesn't, I, I, don't, I don't know how that maths is supposed to work. Keir Starmer might be doing reasonably well in the polls, but Labour are still struggling to offer Britain anything to get excited about. It's something Shadow Cabinet member Emily Formbury seems acutely aware of. She was interviewed by Simon Hattonston in The Guardian this week, and he wrote this. Where is the idealism, the passion, the soul, the vision? Where is the oomph? I mentioned the early days of Corbyn's leadership when so many young people were fired up by politics. She, in turn, talks about singing and dancing her way through the night of the 1st of May 1997 when Labour finally won a general election and walking home in the early hours with a couple of red roses in her hand. Yes, that kind of excitement, she says nostalgically. Well, let's see. Now, in the article after a detour talking about Corbyn's suspension, they come back to the point about excitement and they have this quote from Emily Formbury. We can't promise all the things we want to do, so we're not going to engage the same kind of enthusiasm. I understand that, but to get rid of this lot and have some decent people on board who know where they're going and why they're going there is all right. It's all right. They might not write songs about it, but it will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the inspiring vision for the country. Um, it might be very similar, but there'll be some decent people in charge and, you know, it'll be okay, maybe. She's supposed to be fighting for this government, by the way. All doesn't seem well in a Times interview either. So they interviewed Angela Rayner. Um, and again, that seemed a little bit depressing. This is a paragraph um, from that article. Angela Rayner's new partner is Sam Tarry, the Labour MP for Ilford South in East London, who ran her campaign to become deputy leader. The Corbynista was sacked from the shadow cabinet in July for giving unauthorised interviews on an RMT union picket line and deselected by his constituency in October. When I ask if his deselection felt fair to her, she clams up. I don't know the circumstances within his local party. You'd have to ask them. She doesn't have an opinion. I don't know what the circumstances are. <laughs> Surely you've asked your partner. <laughs> I wouldn't possibly know. I wouldn't. I can't possibly say anything at all about my partner being deselected. I have no knowledge. Whenever he comes home at the end of the day and talks about it, I put my fingers in my ear and say, I have to be loyal to Keir Starmer, which means I don't want to know the corruption that's going on in the party for which I am deputy leader. They're 20 points ahead of the polls. You know, they're, they're odds on to become the next government. Seems kind of sad. It seems like they need some mindfulness in there or at least a little bit, you know, some, some uppers. I don't know. It seems kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
mean, look, I can really empathize with Angela Rayner there. I'm not interested in what my partner has to say either. I couldn't remember a single conversation we've ever had, in fact. I'm just like, no, 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 just sit there and look pretty. I don't really care what's going on with your career. I mean, the Emily Thornberry thing, I find really quite revealing if you take both of the quotes at once. So the first quote, which is when Simon Hattinson is asking about the youth excitement, which really wasn't about Jeremy Corbyn, the personality. It was about the hope that he offered them for a better kind of politics, one where you're not going to be immiserated by debt your whole life, one where homeless people don't die in the street, one where you don't you know, wage illegal wars which destabilize a whole region and kill millions of civilians. That was what people were excited by. And the response is, well, I remember excitement. It was when Labour last won an election. And there's such an emptiness to that, like such a vacuity. It's like, oh, I remember being elated and dancing the night away and walking home with roses in my hands. Okay, but what happened next? Because If you look back at that new Labour era, you had three back-to-back election victories, a landslide. Did Tony Blair bring in changes which embedded and entrenched a more progressive and a fairer society, which would be there even when his government left office? No, quite the opposite. Uh, Thatcher's reforms were deepened through his tenure in office. We had a more financialized economy. You didn't see... um, council housing restored to its pre-Thatcher levels. Uh, You had those public-private partnerships. You didn't have anti-union legislation being rolled back on. And then on top of that, of course, you had disastrous and bloody interventions in the Middle East, which not only led to the rise of ISIS, a uh, in, you know, the endangering of British citizens back home as well. Um, you, you also had trust decimated in politics because everyone knew that we were taken there on a lie. And so it's so telling to me that when asked a question about excitement, the answer is the moment of victory rather than, well, what did you do with power when you had it? What are you excited to do with power when you have it? What are you excited to do for other people? And I think that's why, you know, I th- there are all sorts of reasons for people to be disappointed with Keir Starmer's leadership of Labour, even though they're doing so well in the polls. And for some people, it's going to be the breathtaking deception of his leadership campaign versus where he went, you know, the way in which he called Jeremy Corbyn a friend one minute and is overseeing his exclusion uh, from the Labour candidacy the next. But I think there is something else, which is he's not saying anything to anybody really about how their lives will get better. It's just going to be more competent management of the state. But what that state is supposed to do, what its purpose is and whose interests will it operate, you know, you just get some slogans and nothing else. And that's enough to win one election, I think. Absolutely enough to win one election. But two? Hmm. A much trickier proposition, I think. It's also it's also very depressing to listen to. Like if you're in any kind of situation where you're not like where you're a bit depressed about the future, you know, you can't afford a house, you're paying half your income on rent, like your wages have been stagnant for two decades, maybe you're someone who is earning just over seven thousand four hundred pounds, and so your kids don't get free school meals, right? There are lots of people having a very difficult time right now. And if all you're being offered, you know, the best case scenario at the next election is Labour getting a majority, right? That's not there's no other there's no other possibility, really. Um, I suppose my favourite scenario would be that there's, you know, Labour have one short of a majority and it's Jeremy Corbyn that, whose votes they need to get to pass any legislation. I think that would be the banter timeline. But speaking practically and realistically, you know, we're looking for a Labour government. And if all they can say is like, yeah, the one thing you have to look forward to is going to be kind of shit anyway. Like, it just feels a bit like you might as well give up. I mean, obviously, we're not going to give up because we're not putting all of our faith in the Labour Party. We could do other things. We could push them when they're in power, hopefully. But I mean, it just, it's just to sound so depressed when you're close to power is quite worrying. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly forgiving of the Labour Party, you know, more forgiving than many other people of sort of like Keir Starmer not wanting to necessarily be tied down to specific policy proposals here and there. 
Like, I think there are good arguments as to why he should. There are arguments as to why he shouldn't. But if you can't even offer a coherent vision that, like, life's going to be better. Like, she's, she didn't even say life's going to be better. She said it will be okay. It'll be all right. And the people in power won't be able to do very much, but they'll be a bit nicer than the people before. I mean, that's like a parody of centrism, right? It's like the, the same policies with, with a nicer tone. Also, it seems a bit to me like, you know, there's a meme sort of on left Twitter whereby, you know, like whenever the Tories win, left wingers sort of say it's because people don't want nice things. People want everyone else to be miserable. And I feel like almost like the Labour Party are now buying into that. We're saying, don't worry, we won't make life too nice. It's still going to be pretty shit. So you're safe in voting Labour. Life's still going to be kind of crap. Um, trust us. Completely bizarre. Why not just, you know, you, you can be reassuring whilst also not being completely depressing please i mean yeah i, I hope emily formbury is okay though uh and angela rayner doesn't sound particularly cheery to be either of them at the moment the british media usually is flooded with hateful nonsense when it comes to refugees but on talk tv this week someone cut through the lies my commonality here is i don't want people in hotels i don't want no one that no one wants taxpayers' money being wasted uh, over five million pounds a day on hotels. What we need to be doing to solve this problem is simple: make asylum decisions. Because when people are in the asylum system, they're not allowed to work. A lot of people don't realise that. Yeah. People in the asylum system are legally prevented from working in the UK. They're legally prevented from working. They're legally prevented from paying tax, contributing and taking care of their family. And every person I've ever met that has come to the UK wants to contribute, work and take care of their family. So why can't we let them? Why can't we make those asylum decisions? What is the point in having an Afghan person an Iranian person, where we know they can't return to their home country, what's the point in leaving them festering in a hotel with the far right screaming abuse and setting light to cars? Give them status, get them going, get them working and get them out of the hotels, get them contributing. That's what people want. Um, so mm -hmm. let's just do that. Let's just take all and the... And we need the workers. We need the workers. We need the workers. Exactly. We're desperate. 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 I Fruit just, pickers and anything. Yeah. I, this is pointless. These pointless arguments that are eye-wateringly expensive, that are terrifying for the people in those hotels. It's it's a pointless, divisive rhetoric that I'm afraid to say has been led by our politicians. Mm -hmm. When we have a Home Secretary that yeah. stands in Parliament and says we are being invaded. We're not being invaded. The numbers are tiny. Proportionately, we're talking about the same amount of people that goes towards Man United in Old Trafford on a Saturday coming here in the course of a whole year. Look at the world. Look at all of the conflict. Look at all of the poverty, the exploitation, the persecution. Can we not take a few thousand people and let them work and let them take care of their families in peace? That's all we want. That was Lou Calvey, who you heard from there. Um, if you recognise her, maybe because we've had her on Navarra Media recently, but then she was putting forward that message to, you know, presumably the predominantly right-wing audience from Talk TV. Um, Ash, I thought that was just, like, so impressive, that articulation of, of the argument made there. It is just such an effective communication strategy, which is taking the frame of right-wing myths and almost just turning them inside out. So rather than starting from the defensive of going, oh, well, actually, asylum seekers don't get that much. You're like, oh, no, actually, you go, yeah, you know what? It is too expensive. And that's because they're running it prioritizing cruelty over common sense, humane decisions. And it's bringing all these things into alignment. What makes the most sense and what's most efficient? What's most humane? Um, and also what's most cost effective? So in a hostile a media setting. And of course, Trisha Goddard is not as hostile someone uh, to be interviewed by as say, like a Mike Graham or a Nick Ferrari kind of figure. But talk TV generally is a hostile media space to take the right wing and, um, you know, anti asylum seeker frame, turn it inside out like that works really, really well. And also putting the blame on politicians and saying, look, they're the ones pursuing this totally, uh, you know, bananas policy, one which just leaves people in limbo for ages. It's, you know, absolutely debilitating 
on their physical and their mental well-being. And it's such an inefficient use of public funds. Well, it's because politicians are leading the argument in a way where they can only respond with more cruelty. So I thought that was a really um, effective way to communicate. And it's 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 tough, right? It's 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 tough to make the case. Um, I mean, I guess just standing up for the basic humanity of asylum seekers because it feels like the entirety of the media landscape is either deeply, deeply hostile. Uh, you see the language of invasions and front lines being, uh, you know, taken up by the conveyor belt of mainstream media, lifted right out of the pamphlets of the far right. Um, but interventions like this, they matter and they are useful um even though they're in this this hostile space maybe one person maybe two people hear that and they go from being undecided to being more sympathetic and you know what jobs are good and Jonathan Gullis is the Tory MP for Stoke-on-Trent North and since his election in 2019 he's been no stranger to controversy. In 2020 he was criticised for calling the media's reporting on Covid deaths a sick obsession. Um, He didn't want them to report on tragedy and Tory failure. Then in 2021 at the Tory party conference he made headlines after saying anyone using the term white privilege should be reported to the Home Office. And Gullis is back, and he's posted this rather bizarre video online. Since 2019, I've been working hard to deliver over 200 brand new police officers for Staffordshire Police, get new and improved CCTV for Kidsgrove Talk and Newchapel, and secure £2 million of funding for Stoke-on-Trent from the Safer Streets Fund. But I want Stoke-on-Trent North, Kidsgrove and Talk to get more. And that's why I'm asking you to sign my petition so we can get more alley gates, better street lighting and additional CCTV to help us feel safe across our communities. In places like Smallthorn, where we sadly see scumbags who fly tip their filth in our community. In Cobridge, where scrotes deal and shoot up their drugs, wreaking havoc on our community. And in Tunstall, where savages and their antisocial behaviour causes mayhem for local businesses and local people. So show your support for Safer Streets by signing my petition. That was Jonathan Gullis calling his constituents scrotes and savages. Um, and I mean, what's probably most confusing, so he's he's saying he wants more funding for all this stuff. He's a Tory MP. The Tories have been in power for 13 years. It's their austerity which caused this. You could say, or maybe he's talking about local politics. Stoke-on-Trent, where he represents, the council is also Tory. So who is it? My question to you, Ash, who is this petition directed to? Who's going to receive this petition? Uh, the scrotes and the scumbags, Michael, cough up <laughs> to deal with fly tipping. I mean, I mean, what this is 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 such a classic um, Tory strategy, and you know, Jonathan Gullis did not invent it. Uh, it makes me think about a lot of the sort of early two thousand discourses where you had a kind of simultaneous moral panic about chavs and asylum seekers. And the narrative was, okay, well, you've got this sort of like, you know, decent working class, but then beneath that is this horrible underclass made up of like Vicky Pollards and Romanians. And they're the people who are dirty and disruptive and criminal and dangerous. And they're the ones who are responsible for this overall sense of decline that you both feel and can witness in your community. Because, you know, after the factory shut down and transport funding got slashed and the jobs all went somewhere else, you have been able to see firsthand what has happened to the standard of living and the sense of hope and optimism in the place where you live. So these, um, you know, kind of deviant and dirty big O others were really convenient scapegoats for both right-wing politicians and also new Labour politicians. And it was definitely a moral panic which was taken up by the tabloid media of the time, most notably The Sun, News of the World and The Daily Express. And I was doing a little bit of research looking at how the asylum issue was presented back in the early 2000s. And I found this really quite astonishing intervention from the then mayor of Peterborough, who was going, yeah, like Peterborough is now a crime infested shithole and blaming it on asylum seekers. And I was like, bro, 
you're the mayor. You're the mayor of Peterborough. Like, if it's a shithole, it's happening on your watch. But the te- the strategy is to try and play on people's, you know, very visceral sense of disgust, whether that's on a class basis or a racial basis. So you don't have to take account of, uh, accountability as a person in power. It's also just so classically authoritarian that it's sort of like, it's even if it's somewhat inconsistent, just they just want to make people do stuff. So it's sort of like asylum seekers ban them from working. Single mums force them to work. People with disabilities force them to prove that they have an incredibly severe disability or force them to work. It's just sort of like, why just leave people alone? You know, so, you know, I suppose people know, like control freakery is something that's what people understand from their day to day life. And I feel like it is really translated into politics. You just got people saying, you should do this. You shouldn't do this. You have to do this. And then anyone who doesn't fall into their really arbitrary categories gets called a scumbag or a savage. I mean, a, sa- a savage is particularly extreme. Um, Ash, in your research, have you come across many MPs calling their constituents savages? I mean, I mean, yes, yes, because that was the Chav moral panic. I mean, you must remember remember it from the 2000s, Michael, where the hoodie as an item of Mm. clothing was so stigmatized. It was honestly seen as, you know, the next step was, you know, GBH, you know, you pulled your hood up the next thing, you know, you know, you're kneecapping people or something. And I remember it used to be like top of the news agenda, like should kids in hoodies be allowed in shopping centers. And it is that kind of, you know, little policeman who lives inside every middle Englander who was being appealed to. And I think that in some ways it spoke to something real, which is a sense of of abandonment by the state. You're being abandoned to a form of decline. But also some of it is that, you know, I think in lots of ways we're, you know, we're, we're a country of school prefects and we kind of, you know, we like being authoritarian only as long as we ourselves are not subject to that form of authoritarianism. It's very much rules for thee, but not for me. And, you know, there's a sort of famous saying about conservatism that its very essence is the idea of, you know, there are my friends who the law protects, but does not bind. And there are my enemies who the law binds, but does not protect. And that is what is being leveraged here, in my opinion. That is deep. I hadn't heard that phrase. Where's that phrase from? Does that have a... I I don't know, know, Michael. It's from the internet. Wow. You should claim it if it hasn't been claimed already. Um, Ash, thank you for joining me this evening. Always a pleasure. I missed you. You can't like get rid of me and send me out to presenting Siberia. You know, I want to be Monday with you. I get separation anxiety. Yeah, well, if you want to um, watch Presenting Siberia, uh, tune in to Navarra Media tomorrow at 6pm for the Tuesday edition of Navarra Live, which is fantastic. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing um, that slow, Ash, um, although I am delighted to have you back on Monday evenings. Um, for now, um, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.